Hey there. Are you tired of waiting for the next episode of It's Probably Not Aliens? Well, we've got some good news for you. On Nebula, our streaming service, you can get access to all our episodes a week early. That's right. You'll never have to wait again to hear Scott and I debunk the latest ancient astronaut theory or get a movie fact wrong. But that's not all. Nebula is home to dozens of content creators we know you like, so you can find all your favorites in one place. Plus, we post content on there that you won't find anywhere else. And the best part? By signing up for Nebula at nebula.tv slash probablynotaliens, you're directly supporting the show and both of us. So don't wait any longer. Join Nebula today and listen to the next episode right after this one. a fun fact for you today Tristan Mm. we're talking about rockets we're talking about space race yeah all that sort of fun stuff this is a fun little fact that I learned many years ago that has stuck its way into my brain it's a comic book fact hey I used to do comic book stuff remember when I used to do that you used to do a thing called uh what misconceptions comic misconceptions comic misconceptions that's what I used to do. It was a pun on common misconceptions, you see. I see. Uh. The Fantastic Four, very famous for flying off into a, in a space rocket, rockets, eh? topical, yeah. into space, and they got hit with cosmic radiation, you know? The original draft of the Fantastic Four script from Stan Lee said that they were they were taking off to Mars. That's specifically where they were going to go. The Fantastic Four. They were going to go to Mars in their rocket all the way back in the 60s. Stan Lee changed it last minute to say stars were going off to the stars because he fully believed that by that point, it was possible that the Soviets would have already landed a human on Mars. And so he was like, well, we need to, uh, we're going to, in case America isn't the first one to do that, we need to say, we need to like race somewhere else. We're racing to the stars. Yeah. So to speak. Moving the goalposts. Moving the goalposts a little bit. Was he right? Have we landed a person on Mars yet? Nope. (laughs) Just Matthew Damon. Stan didn't even get to live to see that happen. I'm realizing now. That's (sighs) sad. Stan, yeah. Stan had a, like you can tell through a lot of Marvel stuff that he he seemed to have a lot of genuine empathy and and, uh, and like a lot of pain over the sort of cruelties and and injustices of the world he lived in. But he had an overall optimism for humanity that comes out in his work. Yeah, he. Wa- I got really nervous in the last episode because you were talking about how typically people who show like a really heavy interest in technology turn out to be fascists. And I was like, Stanley, no, not everybody. But there is like a, what I what I would say to kind of clarify on that is that fascists. There's it's not so much a big interest; it's a fetishization of technology. It's the idea gotcha. they become obsessed with the idea that technology is going to solve every problem and is is like the solution to every issue. Yeah, I that. wouldn't classify Stan Lee as a tech bro, so I think he's safe. Yeah, so that, but, for now, but that is uh, that, that that's a clear distinction. And hopefully, in the mm-hmm. weeks since the last episode came out, that I haven't been like raked over the grills for. I'm pretty sure your exact words were: "If you have a passing interest in technology, you are." a fascist. Yeah. I believe that is what you said verbatim. And uh, I have a more than passing interest in technology, so. Yeah, two, guy, two guys recording a podcast to go out to the internet, like, I feel like there's a there's some technology between us. Mm-hmm. And like, literally in the break between episodes, I was talking about the Rabbit R1, and we were talking about the weird goggle, the, the Apple goggles and Apple goggles. Alright, just, just to be clear, just, I'm covering my bases now, even though I, I I didn't mean to go to bat for the Apple Vision Pro in the last episode. I was just saying that the, all the dorks who are using it or doing it for clout, I still think it's a bad device. I don't yeah. get it and I don't like it and it costs too much money. I'm just putting that out there. I have a friend who is one of the best people 
people to follow for technology advice and like for buying things. His name is Dimitri. He is okay. his name's Dimitri. He's a really cool guy. He's one of the friendliest human beings on the planet. He has All a right. YouTube channel where he has a relentlessly good release schedule. His videos are super high quality and full of really useful advice and it gets like no attention and it's actually a crime. Wild. So his channel is called Caddick, C-A-D-D-A-C. All right. He's like one of my, like, like we're friends in real life and stuff. And he has some of the best tech advice and like everything for everyone. And he uh, still to this day swears up and down that if you want to get into VR, the MetaQuest 2 is still like pound for pound, the best thing you can get. And, it, and, and since he made that yeah. video, it got even cheaper. So <laughs> it, it, it's still like, yeah. That's the big thing. I'm sure there's great technology in the Apple Vision Pro. It's $3,500 base level. It goes up to almost $4,000. And you know, like, because it's, it's Apple, like $1,500 of that is not the tech. $1,500 of that is the brand. It's the money that goes into the, what was it, the $1,000 computer monitor stand thing? The stand. That is still a joke to me. That's ridiculous that they would even. And look, part of Apple I is like, showing off how rich you are because you can afford Apple products. Like, I that is, like Apple products. I have an iPhone and a MacBook and everything like that. I, I, my ears are filled with ear pods yeah. almost ever, all day long. Meanwhile, I am like, I'm like one good <laughs> shove from like, what's Linux up to? <laughs> yeah. 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 Look, I like Apple stuff. We know who is the Apple and the PC in the commercial here. We do. I just, I'm not a, I'm not a diehard fanboy. I think it's bad. <laughs> I think this device is, again, probably got great technology, way too much money. What do you do with it? I don't know. You can sit in there and watch movies alone. Everyone is like, it is the most immersive movie watching experience. I'm like, you are alone. You are alone. I want to watch TV and movies with my wife. Do we need two of these devices? And then we can't even see each other while we're watching these things. What is, I don't want to do this. The most important part of watching Watching a movie or a TV show at home is pausing it every 30 seconds so that you can comment on something to the other. Do you and guys do that? Are you, do guys, okay, are you guys a couple who do that? Yes. Okay. Of course we do. Yes. So we don't even do the pausing part. We just talk over it. And then the um, immediate next thing the next person says is, wait, what did this character say? And we're like, I don't know. I wasn't paying attention because we were just too busy talking to each other. That's what we do. And I don't want to do that over a FaceTime call with one of those Going, uncanny at, like, valley personas. Face of Emily being like, I don't want to. She's in the room with me. I want to right, see her. I don't. All right. I'm sorry. I am. I listen to so many tech podcasts and almost all of them are like head over heels in love with this thing. And I don't get it. I'm I'm like you're all married though why aren't you also having the why aren't you having these exact same revelations that i am yeah you can watch avatar way of the water alone in 3d but you're alone yeah i lo- like vr i like for i like uh uh thrill the fight the boxing game it's a really good workout uh i mm-hmm. like playing mini golf with dimitri actually dimitri sure. and I play have, have have regular golf dates where we go and play mini putt there's no gaming on this thing they're like there is but there are no like games like made for the apple vi- like they're not even promoting gaming as a feature of it like you can put a game on there people have tried but so like, much to make it uh to make vr work for other things but gaming is really the only thing it really works for yeah all uh, right at the moment i this is the- i just had to get that all off of my chest because yeah, it's been driving me bananas how people are like talking so much about how it's like the most immersive media consumption device. And I'm like, if you are alone, like they're like, it's your biggest screen in your whole house that only one person can watch. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. Cause like, yeah, sometimes it's like you could watch YouTube. I, okay. The one time I did try one time to load the dishwasher while watching a YouTube video, like kind of with the VR headset on. First mm-hmm. of all, I looked like an idiot and my wife made fun of me properly. Like as sure. you should, as a concerned Absolutely. partner would. Um, but then also I realized that like, I don't even like, I don't watch YouTube videos when I'm watching them on my computer. I'm listening to them half the time. So like, what's the point on having exactly. a big ass screen? Like, with, if, like I, if I've had this goggles pinned on my face and I like had a YouTube video pulled up while I was like doing dishes or whatever, I still wouldn't look at it. I would just listen to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So all of that is to say, but I'm not like, you know, I'm not anti VR. I actually, I, like I said, I have a meta quest no, and I enjoy you have it a lot. A uh, meta quest. I don't have any VR, anything. I've only tried it once or twice. This could come out, you know, people could listen back on this in five years and be like, Scott, you dunce. VR and AR, it's everywhere. That's fine. I'm just saying 
this one specific area, people are not talking enough about how it is the loneliest movie watching That's device true. you could possibly have. I think VR is not going to become like a thing like that, like AR, VR, or whatever. It's not going to become like a mainstream thing until it's a pair of glasses, which we're very far away from getting the tech on that. Very going, far so. away from. Uh, but today, but yeah, uh, this is a podcast called It's Probably Not I'm Aliens. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a podcast. You are correct, Tristan. It's, it's called It's Probably Not Aliens. We talk about ancient astronaut theory, the TV show Ancient Aliens. And we look at the pseudo history, pseudo archaeology, pseudo science, even sometimes uh, that the claim of the claims that they make. And uh, along the way, we'll try to teach you some real world history of really cool people and places and things and cultures mm-hmm. and artifacts and all sorts of good stuff. And today we've got a bio episode, a little bit of a bio. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love doing these. It's a, it's a part two from our previous episode about the V1 and V2 rockets. You can listen to uh, that episode if you haven't already but who are we well i my name thank you is scott nice wonder i am known as scott the one nice wonder as we discovered in the uh that article that i was in a oh couple yeah the one yeah, yeah i am just one not even the one i am just one i am scott nice wonder as some someone made a pun of my name on twitter so thank you that is me and i know nothing i came in here to rant about apple vision pro which, which th- that that news is like a month old by now yeah. but thank you i'm tristan johnson i'm the one who does the research and then ends up doing too much so we need to break an episode partway through so that we could do a second one and yes i'm the one who doesn't get quoted in the articles uh this was unplanned we are still recording in the on the same day as we recorded yeah yeah, it's been about 20 minutes or so so 20 minutes scott are you brave am i brave yeah i i'd like to think i'm brave i want to do something very dangerous for this podcast that we definitely couldn't do on youtube oh i want to play a song you're gonna play a song yeah i have a youtube clip in the notes i want you to listen to it okay gather round while i sing you a Werner von Braun, a man oh. whose allegiance is ruled by expedience call him a nazi he won't even frown Nazi schmazi says Werner von Braun. Come on, this is the 1950s. Okay. Don't say that he's hypocritical. Say rather that he's apolitical. <laughs> Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? <laughs> That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. This is pretty you good. It's good, yeah. You a big hero. Once you've learned to count backwards to zero in German or the English, I know how to count down. And I'm learning Chinese, says Werner von Braun. Oh my God. <laughs> so like the, when I heard this, I was like, this was recorded in like 1957, I think. And I'm like, yes, how could you? Tom Lehrer. Yeah. I believe. Can you imagine? Like that is that is for ni- that is 1950s very spicy. Extremely spicy. Height of well, not the height of the space race because uh 19 like what's it called 57 I think was the was the Sputnik launch, but still mm-hmm. like wow. <laughs> it's catchy though too is yeah. also the thing. And every time I think of Werner von Braun, I think of the Tom Lehrer song. So that's who we're talking about. Yeah, today, today. is about Werner von Braun, a person who we have danced around a lot on this podcast uh in the last few episodes cuz we're doing a sort of arc we're going through our nazi arc right now uh where we are uh dealing with the fact that um there we're going through an ancient aliens episode where they're focused on aliens of the third reich and we've just recently talked about the v1 and v2 rocket program and we've talked about operation paperclip in the past and all of this is to say that at its core it's all connected yeah and it's all connected under uh, one of the major figures that you need to kind of understand to realize the kind of uh, uncomfortable politics of mm. the connection. Because like one of the things about the the Nazi UFO conspiracy is that the U.S. gathered all of these secrets and brought them to Area 51 so that they could reverse engineer it themselves under something mm-hmm. called Operation Paperclip, which we have talked about where the Americans uh, basically scrubbed the histories of a bunch of Nazi scientists in order to bring them to America so that they could do work for them specifically yep. to uh, fight communism. That's sort of the, 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 the big, the big draw to combat the Soviet union, which had the a similar program where they just kind of 
kidnapped scientists and try to force them. It uh-huh. didn't work out as well. No. Uh, one of the major figures, though, because he became a celebrity in America in the 1950s and 60s, especially in the 1960s, but uh, became one of the most influential scientists of the 20th century. And one of the key parts of America's development in rocketry and rocket science, and which includes space travel, but also includes ballistic missiles and all that kind of stuff. And it is Werner von Braun, somebody who has a, as, as Tom Lehrer pointed out, has mm-hmm. some, uh, a checkered past. A checkered past, to say the least. So I wanted to do a bit where we just finally talk about who this guy is. Finally. So that when I mention him in the future, I could just say, we did an episode on Werner Von Braun. You can listen to it there. There's a song about him Mm -hmm. you can also listen to. All right. Let's get into Werner Von Braun. Obviously, we're going to be a bit light on the UFO stuff today. So a little bit light. It's like, yeah. oops, because this is like we I record. I had a whole episode's notes and then we cracked the episode in half partway through. So this is kind of like, oops, all history episode. I like it because we kind of did all the debunking in the la- in part one. But again, like you said, so connected to almost to a lot of these theories. That yeah, it's important. We focus focus on him. Mm hmm. Plus, people who listen to the show seem to like learning history sometimes. So, yeah. Werner von Braun, born in 1912 in the city of Wörtisch in uh, Germany, which is now the city of Wörtisch in Poland. Okay. And he was from a rich, semi-aristocratic family. So he's related to like Prussian nobility or German nobility. Ah. So had a very like, you know, pampered, uh, like you know, fancy childhood, fancy lad. Fancy child. Mm Mm-hmm. Fancy pants. As a child, he got really into space exploration. Okay. He read a book by Herman Oberth called The Rocket Into Interplanetary Space, and it captivated his imagination. Mmm. Rockets. Interesting. Well, when I do these like uh, biography episodes, I kind of like to open up a tab with just a picture of him so I can kind of get his vibe while I'm talking about it. That's a good call. Honestly, like a lot of the, um, one of the things you might recognize him from is like a lot of, I think a lot of of the inspiration and development of Tony Stark's father kind of comes from Werner von Braun. It's like Walt Disney plus Werner von Braun. Yeah, exactly. That's Howard Stark. Yeah, that's kind of the kind of the vibe they go for. And like a lot of the like old videos and like what was the Iron Man movie that had a lot of focus on Howard Stark? Oh, uh, the second one? Second one? Yeah, a lot of that had I think like vibes of like Werner von Braun's like public addresses and stuff like that. You know what's really cool is when I Google pictures of Werner von Braun. A lot of Elon Musk. A lot of Elon Musk. I was going to say a lot of Elon Musk. A lot of That's people. That's interesting. Yeah. The only difference between Werner von Braun and Elon Musk is that one actually did contribute to rocketry. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> That's about it. Uh- <laughs> Well, hold on, Tristan. Are you saying that Elon Musk was also grew up a very uh, wealthy individual with uh, uh, a very privileged childhood? And had part of his backstory involve slave labor? Mm, interesting. Just interesting, 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 interesting. And he got a similar story. Interesting, on interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, Werner von Braun, growing up in 1912, Germany. So keep in mind, Germany at this point, very like uh, pre World War I was like this country on the rise. It shows up in 1870 with. Yeah. A bunch of varied uh, German, like, big story. Germany used to be this complicated mix of duchies and and principalities and theocracies called the Holy Roman Empire until Napoleon Mm -hmm. basically smashed that system apart. And then what was replaced was like a handful of these like small German states that then the Prussian uh, Empire sort of amalgamated through war into one German state, which in in 1870, because of like big coal deposits, but like various other things became like this extremely powerful economic country and imagine like european right. history centuries where the t- the major powers are france uh-huh. france britain for a while spain but spain's sort of on the wane at this point but france Spain's on the wane yeah oh that makes me sad as rain what a pain spain's on the wane spain's on the wane britain was like you know the 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 naval powerhouse france had the largest and most powerful military the world had ever seen they that was like the power balance in europe and then germany shows up on the scene and instantly becomes like one of the most industrious countries on earth one of the chief like leaders in scientific advancement 
And like the entirety of Europe is terrified of what's going to happen when they come online and start like doing stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. And when they log in. <laughs> the, for the answer to that is the first half of the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, uh, but you can imagine like growing up in this time where you're living in Germany, where this there's like a lot of nationalism. It's a new young country where there's a lot of patriotism. And there's like science is like science and technology is ballooning out of control, right? I can't, I can, Tristan, I can imagine that more than you think. Oh yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, America currently America. is older than yeah. Germany was at the time, but like America still pretty young country. Yeah. Still very patriotic. Technology's going wild over here. What's happening? Oh yeah. Well, uh, so von Braun was part of this, this generation of young Germans who were coming up through this system and he got really into space travel. So much they joined the German Society for Space Travel in 1928, and then he later went on to work for the German army. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. He received a bachelor's degree in aeronautics engineering in 1932 from Berlin Institute of Technology, good old BIT. I think uh, German Noam Chomsky worked there. Oh, that's a, it's a MIT joke. Anyways, okay, failed. Oh, um, I I'm can not I get like, smart I get like a, to get your. Uh, I'll give you a little rim shot here. Here's I know. Give little... me like the, the sad horn. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, this is a failed joke. I didn't. I'm not smart enough to get your humor. The the Berlin Institute of Technology in Massachusetts. I don't know. It's fine. It's, yeah, it's fine. I was in my head thinking of a Bitcoin joke, oh. and so I wasn't fully paying attention. That's fine. That's fine. That's a, that's a better joke than what I was going to make. <laughs> he then got a P, and then somehow two years later got a PhD in physics from the University of Berlin in 1934. Uh, As somebody who has done three mm. quarters of a PhD and who's married to someone with a PhD and knows a lot of people with PhDs, two years is obscene by today's standards. Didn't even get a master's degree in the middle there it's it's wild they just i didn't realize you and i had i mean i didn't go for a phd but i did three quarters of just a regular degree in college and i gave up did you and you did three quarters of a phd yes did you give up or did you not or were you like kicked out i was sort of i actually failed out that's on me i didn't actually give up I, I, I mean, I gave up long before I was kicked out, but it took them a while to finally kick I, me out. I dropped out after a year of uh, doing step back rather than my dissertation. And then at the end of the year, they were like, hey, do you want to send hey. us a report on how progress in your dissertation has gone? And I'm like, I have to go. <laughs> that is so why I did the same thing with NerdSync. I, yeah. was, I got three years into college, but I was already doing NerdSync and it, was, it wasn't successful. But I was like, I'm having way more fun doing this than going to class. Yeah. So that, yeah, similar story. And uh, I'm, I'm now that I'm looking for a real job, I'm kind of paying for that. <laughs> yeah, don't follow our example, yeah. uh, children. Go to college if you can. My resume is a nightmare. Then again, I was going to get a PhD in history. What's that going to get you on the job market? <laughs> you could be on a podcast. Yeah. Hey, achieve that. Get stoked later for when we segue to product and service. Yeah. Okay. So Von Braun, growing up in this uh, this you know situation of, uh, of being a promising young uh, scientist interested in space, then joined the Nazi party in 1937, and then 1940 became an SS officer, which is sort of like the elite mm. group of the of the Nazi party, typically like you know secret police, but also like you know just high high ranking officers. Yeah, you're going to get a lot of this today, and you get a lot of this from former Nazis who were trying to rehabilitate his involvement uh-huh. with the party and with the the SS was a matter of career expediency rather than ideology. He didn't believe I in didn't the Nazis. Like what they were, I didn't like what they were doing. But I joined but the party it sure anyway. sure did help me. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll make a big deal talking about how they didn't know what was going on. I didn't know. The, the degree to which that is true is... Um, always like in contention and unfortunately yeah. von braun is far too dead to speak to this himself so if we had a scroll of speak with dead we could ask him at least five questions there you go number one what did you think of that song we just played was it funny that's two questions dang it <laughs> history already history I'm, I'm would be a, out. Yeah, history would be a very different discipline if you had a scroll of speak with dead i'll say that yeah so then uh he became the technical director of the premenut army research center where he was part of the development of the v2 rocket program during world war ii the only thing that kind of like sticks out as like him breaking with Nazi uh, ideology is that he was one time arrested in 1944 by the Gestapo, which is sort of the secret police for the for, quote, expressing defeatist sentiments. But he was then released because his involvement with the V2 rocket program was so important that he evaded the law. Uh, so, OK. <laughs> 
So he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't believe in the Nazi ideology. He, he merely joined the party for expediency, but nonetheless became so key and important to the Nazi party. Super important that yeah. even they were like, okay, but you can just keep, keep doing your thing. We need you actually. This is important. It is funny that he was arrested for expressing defeatist sentiments, not like, not like opposing sentiments, right? Yeah, not just like, yeah. this is wrong that you're doing, but more so just like, I don't know if we're going to win this gang. Yeah. Saying in 1944, when it was already extremely obvious that the Germans were going to lose World War II, that the Germans were going to lose World War II, uh, is, you know, is a, yeah. a little bit of a point in his favor because he's just saying what is extremely obvious at that point. I guess what I'm saying is... I, I I understand it's not a weird thing to say, but like clearly he was not outspoken. Like if he was trying to be like, I didn't. He was know. like, I really don't like all this anti-Semitism stuff we're doing. Yeah, he never said that. Yeah. Or else they definitely would have arrested him for that. Yeah. Considering the the bar was so low as just to express a very commonly known thing that they weren't going to win at that mm-hmm. time. And this yeah. this comes up a lot with him where he when he's asked about this kind of stuff, he very much defaults to like, it was for my career. Everyone was part of the party at that time. It was what you needed to do in order to advance. And like, I didn't know what was going on. And like, it's very like this, this, this is like an, not an yeah. uncommon story that shows up with these kinds of uh, people who are involved in this way. And to which degree that's actually true. I <laughs> seems like uh, when, we, when I made that giant list of all of the Jewish scientists who left Germany before the war seemed pretty aware that the the Nazi government was not uh, doing great stuff. So yeah, the argument from like, I was ignorant of what was going on. Um, mm, uh, it, it always rings a little hollow to me, but dubious. Yeah. But, it, but also it was like a common defense that a lot of Germans had when confronted about like, how much did you know about what was happening? And a lot of times they'll say like, we didn't know anything. And um, that has been a defense for a long time. And people have, had question marks about that and uh mm. you know it's all it's again uh, a lot of the times when we try to talk about the nazi regime in a historical context we like to otherize it to talk about the nazis as if they were some like singular alien right. threat and not like a thing that a lot of people gave a lot of slack to and a lot of like like ignored a lot of the warning signs that were clearly there uh until right. it was far too late so hundred yeah, percent. Speaking of um, horrible things, there's a clear connection between von Braun's program and mm. the Holocaust, which was that uh, yeah, the the V two rocket program did use forced labor from concentration camps, and because of the harsh conditions, there were thousands of prisoners who died in the construction of these V two rockets. Mm. These things that he was you know high up in developing, but knew nothing about their construction. How they just show up at my door fully assembled. It's weird. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they get here. And as Tom Lehrer very clearly pointed out, he had to be aware of what these rockets were being developed to do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so that that's I just a big I'm just a big fan of rockets. That's that's and a song. I, uh, I know. I care about I, my job is is making them go up. I, where they go down is not my job. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't care. That's not my that's not my department. My department is making rockets go up, mm-hmm. and I like that part. That's basically the argument uh, a lot of people made for them. The other thing too is that it's also true that the those slave camps and like those places where the V two rockets were um, were built. There is no evidence showing that Werner von Braun actually ever went to these places. So there is like. Like maybe a defense that uh plausible deniability yeah that he didn't see what was going on but uh there are some people who did like magnus von braun Ooh, any relation his brother <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> um and magnus von braun uh was involved and did see what was going on so it's either it's either magnus or his uh, other brother uh sigismund they probably talked right yeah so you think they probably talked a little bit yeah so part of this is implying that that Werner never talked to his brother about the conditions of the rockets that he was building, which might have happened if he kind of knew, but he didn't want to know the details. And like, he just like, like let's just not talk about this. Me, yeah. Hey, hey, bro, I love you. 
Do not tell me any of the details about how these rockets are made. I like, I like just in my head, imagining that they just show up fully assembled. And Mm -hmm. I don't need to know any more details than that. Yeah. Just think about how much he actually knew about who, if you didn't know that slave labor was building them, then what did he think was building them? (laughs) Uh, reasonably compensated workers who like are really passionate about building rockets. Mm. And it makes their day better when they get to build rockets for me. Consider me skeptical. Um, so after the <laughs> war, his 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 slate of arguments were that he didn't he was unaware that the Holocaust was happening and that he had what he what he called uh, regret for the working conditions that were imposed on prisoners. But there's there's some skepticism over whether or not his remorse was sincere or just a like sort of PR statement he needed to say in order to uh, keep being an important part of the American rocketry program. Is he sorry? that he did it or is he sorry he got caught yeah, for real <laughs> but he said yeah he had deep and sincere regret for the victims of the v2 rockets because those v2 rockets he developed were then go on to kill thousands of people yeah that he was on a, that again there are reports that so, show that von braun was aware of the concentration camps and the use of forced labor and that his remorse was more about uh protecting his reputation and his career mm-hmm. and a lot of his post-war statements about his time in germany are you know not exactly like it's like straightforward he admitted that he he did pretty well under totalitarianism, but called, uh, he described Hitler as quote, a pompous fool, which is, I mean, if you're in a situation where you know Hitler well enough to describe his personality, um, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, but even so like, it's a very brave thing to say after the war is over. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Hey everyone. Now that he's gone, I got some thoughts to say about Hitler. Honestly, not a fan. I didn't care for the guy. Yeah. But again, after having extensive, ex- like after ha- being high enough in the Nazi authority that he could know Hitler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pompous is such a, is such a specific thing. Like that is what you would need to be around someone and know someone to use it. Fool. You could call anyone a fool. That's my favorite way to greet an audience with, uh, in a gender neutral way. Hey, just fools. Shout it. Just shout fools. And that's how you greet everyone. Nice. Uh, without lady, without saying ladies and gentlemen, cause you know, Know, like some people i i'm a gender i don't fall into that so you know what i mean yep. so that that works but pompous is like you really gotta know someone's personality to call them pompous i feel also just like calling hitler a pompous fool feels like um it's like calling him like man that guy was such a jerk and i'm like the guy's responsible for 20 million deaths plus <laughs> like you know <laughs> genocide the thing that you have an ish- yeah the biggest issue about hitler is that he was a little pompous he was a dick yeah yeah um just like i don't know like the the, the gravity is a little so so people have t- said that his uh his way that he talks about it was maybe like there's there's two like was he either yeah you know ideologically unopposed at least to the rampant anti-semitism and brutal uh like treatment of Jews, Romani people, homosexuals, communists, disabled people that were yep. exterminated in mass numbers during the war. Mm-hmm. Or was the other one where he was just an opportunity opportunist who saw the military as a way to get funding for his rockets and didn't particularly care about the consequences of what making rockets would mean under such a regime. Yeah. That's I just like making my little rockets. Yeah. I just like making my little my little cylinders that mm-hmm. go up. I assume their cylinders but at the end of the day that's sort of where we're at he claims that he didn't know there's a lot of question marks about whether or not he knew and how much he knew and also how sincere he was and how bad he felt about what happened it didn't really matter because when he expressed defeatist sentiments during in 1944 he was far too important by that point to the american rocketry program to uh, ah. to have to face justice for anything he did anyway twist yes interesting so at the end of uh at the end of world war ii von braun and his team surrendered to the u.s army openly brought them all of the plans and test vehicles for his rockets i just want to make my little rockets i don't care who's making them who i'm making them for i just like making my little rockets yeah so uh anything that he did or didn't do during the nazi regime he uh got cleared of all of those under operation paperclip where he then became a naturalized u.s citizen he married maria Luis von Kustorp in 1948, had two daughters and a son, had like the most like, you know, stereotypical, a middle American white picket fence, a dog, maybe Mm -hmm. a dog that barks in German. (laughs) That's more French, I guess. (laughs) 
<laughs> Bark. Oh God. It's a very French dog. Yeah. We we I don't know if this will make it in the edit. Tristan and I both sat here in like a full two seconds of silence, both independently thinking of how to bark, to like bark a German in dog. German. Yeah. <laughs> The silence was palpable. It is powerful stuff. Um, but yeah, Werner von Braun, after World War II, uh, got brought over and became an important person for a little organization you might call the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Oh, I'm itching to learn more about this naysay that you have just described to me. I don't know what that is, but maybe we should maybe we should pay some bills. Yeah, let's do it. I've just put together that maybe it's not pronounced naysay. Maybe it's pronounced NASA. I think that's a country. Narsar. That's how you'd pronounce that's it. That's in Australia. In Australian. NASA. He joined NASA. He joined NASA. what yeah, we're trying yeah, to yeah. say. So, Tell me about this. So his, his path to NASA began with uh, working on rockets for the U.S. Army at Fort Bliss, Texas, which then he got moved to Huntsville, Alabama to work on the Redstone Arsenal. So this is him. Basically, after World War II, America was gearing up for a geopolitical conflict with the Soviet Union. Cold War, we're all aware. And one of the things that they were working on immediately was, hey, remember those things that we used to kill 100,000 Japanese people? How do we mm. make those bombs bigger and able to go further? Big gun. We talked about this last episode. Big gun. Well, they Big gun make bullet go far. They, I mean, it seemed like they were they were instead opting for the rocket option. So, all right. So Werner von Braun, you know, with the V2 rocket experience and handing over all of the V2 rocket uh, secrets to the, to NASA or to the U.S. government, he got picked up and basically became part of the development of ballistic missiles. Other examples of those being the Jupiter C, the Juno 2, the Saturn 1, and uh, the Jupiter C, uh, which would be the rocket that would uh, launch the first U.S. satellite, Explorer 1, in 1958. Dang. Yep. In 1960, President Eisenhower moved his rocket development group at the uh, Redstone Arsenal to NASA. NASA. His job there was going to be to develop the Saturn rockets, which would eventually propel Americans to the moon. I like talking about rockets when it's about exploration and travel and stuff. I it's not. I like using rockets for cool things and not death. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know I mean? yeah, and unfortunately, there is like this uncomfortable connection that we can't really break because yeah, I doubt that America was so altruistic that their the money like that was put in to make the space race happen would have happened if it wasn't for the fact that they needed to develop ICBMs that were more powerful and could be used right. to fire nuclear warheads at the Soviets. I mean, there's always when yeah, any sort of like develop technological development in America is always always like ha tacked on like and also the reason for this is so we could do wars i mean we're literally talking over a communications protocol that was designed so that uh, we could have a decentralized communications network in case uh the u.s ever got hit by a nuclear strike and had its main hubs and spokes of its communication networks broken so yeah rockets that launch satellites I bet satellites are neutral I, yeah. and don't don't play into warfare at all. I kind of have a short story that I want to write about this. And I do think that like, because I one of the things I don't know if I've talked about this in the show, but what I was in doing my PhD to do was as a technology historian. Oh, uh, my my like main like focus was was the history of technology and specifically the history of the development of communications technology. Mm -hmm. um, so as a technology, as, as something, someone who could almost call nerd, himself a you can say yeah. it. Well, yeah. no, as somebody who could theoretically call himself a technology historian in the very loosest sense of the word, mm -hmm. we have very rarely a techno historian. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, we have very like a lot of major breakthroughs in technology have like we can't really choose. People innovate constantly in various different contexts, and we have very little choice over what context new technologies come out of, who they're made to serve, and and what uh, and, and and that kind yeah. of thing. Obviously, this is something that we should we should uh, approach, but like we can't we, we we don't we wouldn't have like right now we are on the cusp of developing 
fusion power, nuclear fusion mm. technology that could have been used to, that can be used to provide nearly limitless energy for our civilization for a, for a long, long, long time. It could be completely game changing. Obviously, we're still many decades away from it being mainstream, but we are like the science for it is just now becoming possible. We would not have that if it wasn't for the fact that we learned that fusion makes more powerful explosions during a nuclear to make for a nuclear explosion. And the sort of link between nuclear weapons and nuclear power is is inseparable and the same with with rockets and space exploration and icbms and the cold war and that kind of stuff yeah i mean the road of technological progression is paved with the blood of innocence we get it that's one way to say it um <laughs> that's one way to twist your words but i got in some ways like sometimes even the most profound and important inventions in our civilization's history have a dark connection to them and so we have to sort of um figure out how we relate those together anyway yeah anyways um so when he was transferred to nasa he became the director of the marshall space flight center where he was the chief architect of the saturn V rocket which was the super booster that sent the first people to the moon this is the rocket of the apollo program if you're thinking mm. of like any of like those sort of old school footage of rockets going up that's those mm -hmm. are all saturn fives for the most part nice yeah, huge achievement in rocket science. Uh, the Saturn V enabled 16 of astronauts to reach the surface of the moon, which is a outstanding achievement that hasn't been replicated in like 50 years. We're like planning Why on not? going to the um, mostly because once they had the ICBM and the cold and like by like the 1970s, America's budgets were starting to get a little tight. But also it was very clear that the Soviet Union was extremely far behind on the technological arms race and their nuclear arsenal, while bigger, was way less sophisticated. And also in the 1970s, they were going through something called detente, which was sort of this period where the Cold War was getting a little bit less intense. So mm -hmm. all of those things like uh, led to them no longer really having to prioritize developing new and more powerful nuclear bombs, which led to a huge cutback in NASA's budget. Plus, like by like the last mission where like they were sending people to the moon to play like golf and like drive around in little cars and stuff like that, uh, people were no mm -hmm. longer into like the sort of the hype had been had been taken away and it was no longer like a big PR thing either. So all that is to say gotcha. is like people were like th it all resulted in like NASA cutting back its scope and its projects and instead of focusing on like going to Mars or going to uh or, or like you know making a more permanent like you know moon base or something like that going to the stars going to the like stars Stanley like Stan wanted yeah. instead of that they focused more on developing low earth orbit which they had they made Skylab which was like a, a, a NASA's first space station but then they also yeah. uh tried to develop a new space vehicle that was reusable so it could be more efficient and cheap and that was a development of the space shuttle program oh yeah and sort of sort of like the space shuttle is almost like a symbol of nasa cutting back on its um on its ambitions that's so funny because i think it's the coolest looking it is cool <laughs> it looks it looks way cooler than just like a rocket though yeah no it, it, it did it was genuinely like a, an important development in like you know space technology just it was in many ways it was a symbol of them trying to be more cost efficient and also uh showing that they were dedicating themselves to just studying stuff in low earth orbit and not like you know going off to new places yeah uh, we're just now sort of changing that and it's very funny because nasa's whole space program to go to the moon is being heavily delayed because they tied up way too many of their contracts in spacex and nothing in spacex is actually being finished or is working so they have to like <gasps> cancel their contract and develop their own things that they had just uh, uh... like uh, right now they had to delay the sp like there was supposed to be a moon landing this year and it got delayed i think until 2026 that? because um jeez they uh uh, SpaceX was supposed to make the lunar lander and they didn't. What's Elon doing? Uh, doing what else doing he and on? running Twitter, apparently. Um, uh, he's defend. He's go he's paying all of the court bills for that one lady from Mandalorian or whatever. Oh yeah, that's a real thing. I don't want to get into it. He's really <laughs> it's, he's it's really in the drain right now. Um, it's ridiculous. Which is odd because SpaceX is really the only thing that Elon has that actually makes money. Uh, really? Yeah. Tesla doesn't make money. Yeah, they burn money like they burn passengers yeah. and uh, exploding cars. Oh man. But like that's so like that's the main thing is that like Saturn Five was the workhorse yeah. of NASA and got a lot of people to the moon. And now uh, that then they, 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 they scaled back and uh, starting in the early 1970s and uh, Von Braun though, his contribution to the Apollo program was massive. He was a, a scientist who developed the crucial technologies to get there. He was also a workhorse in like, 
like managing. He became very good at like making design decisions. He was a good like, you know, planner and coordinator. And he became like sort of like the 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 thing that made NASA as successful as it was at doing these things. Mm. And in 1970, when they started sort of backing off of the space program, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he started becoming more into um, strategic planning. But in 1972, yeah. he retired. Okay. And in his last years, he started working for Fairchild Industries, which is sort of like an aerospace company. And then uh, he died of cancer in Alexandria and in Virginia, not too far from where you are, in 1977. From, I had nothing to do with it, just to be clear. You wouldn't be born for almost 20 years. I think you're all, yeah. I think you're off the hook. Thank you. The thing, though, is that his connection to the Nazis was actually not widely known until after he had died. Oh, really? Yeah. It seems to be suggested that uh, a lot of his employers, including the government, but also other people, downplayed or covered up his wartime activities in order to preserve his reputation so that they could keep him on for this crucial work. We like his big brain too much. This guy's obsessed with rockets. And we, and so is America at this point. Uh, so now Von Braun's remembered for being this visionary scientist and then also this black mark of being involved with some of the worst, not some of the worst, like the worst thing that happened in human history, the Holocaust. I yeah. feel like that's that's not a that's not a spicy take. That's not a spicy take to say. And now we kind of live in this sort of complicated two ways of looking at him thing. And this is why I think For All Mankind, where he actually gets his comeuppance while he's alive, is very uh, cathartic to me. Yeah, I think that's good. There is like an alternate history where Jimmy Neutron's dog is named Von Brown. <laughs> and I'm like, no! Oh no. <laughs> Instead of Goddard. Did, did that actually happen or is that just a joke? No, 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 no. I'm just there. There's an alternate timeline of our own history where oh. that could have happened i feel oh no yeah so the thing is that he's not the only person who did that there are many nazi scientists who had been uh had their their backgrounds cleansed and fixed and like you know uh forgiven for their sins and uh brought over to the u.s to mm. contribute science this sounds suspiciously like a part where tristan makes you sad yeah yeah we're doing that now the thing though is that like all like many of them were involved like not just with like you know the slave labor to build the v2 rockets but some were like medical researchers who did concentration camp experiments or used forced labor to make things mm. the problem though is that all of the ethics involved with that got quickly overshadowed by what were called national security concerns because all of a sudden it was extremely important that the soviets be defeated no matter what the cost and so they thought that it was important to uh, for for fighting communism to take all these Nazis and and we need the Nazis because mm -hmm. of all the because of all those dang reds yeah those commies yeah and, and the other part that I think that there's like some real political implications about like the sort of Nazi UFO thing is that it it it, it leads the question well if mainstream historians are wrong about their their UFOs what else have we gotten wrong about the Nazis and that's sort of like to me like the first step towards things like Holocaust denial or Holocaust revisionism. Oh. And a lot of the times the people who are promoting, you know, Nazi UFO stuff, as we mentioned with uh, Ernst Zundel, they were Holocaust, yeah. like, like well-known Holocaust deniers. Uh, the other thing too, is that I think that like Operation Paperclip was a very obvious deal with the devil that, I mean, I wouldn't have made it. I think like the thing, so, yeah, I mean, it's so, I, I just keep thinking about that where they're just like, we need these, we need the Nazis these former Nazis or just Nazis in general to fight against communism. And I'm like, it is so wild that on the question of like the better of two evils, the lesser of two evils, I should say, it's so weird to me that that question, the United States was like, well, clearly the Nazis are the lesser of two evils, right? Nazis versus communists mm, is the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And this like plays into other things too. Like during the war, there was actually some serious thought about something called Operation Unthinkable, which was this mm. idea that during World War II, as the war was coming to an end, they were thinking, what if we just kind of kept going? Like as soon as the Nazis were defeated, just keep pushing into the Soviet Union, which would have been a disaster uh, for them, I think. But either way. Yes. Uh, the thing though is that they basically, the Americans had this concept during the Cold War that they needed to keep a technological edge over the Soviet Union, which as we did see in the 1950s, they, in the 19, early 1960s, they were falling behind pretty hard. Mm -hmm. But eventually the Soviet Union being the way poorer country just wasn't able to keep it up. Like the Soviet Union eventually fell apart because of a rigid economy that really wasn't like, they, they had a sort of conservative leadership that wasn't really adaptable to new things. Their technology just never really, uh, they never 
invested enough in the technology in developing new technologies. They very much had mm -hmm. a idea of like, if we have a thing that works, we don't really need to improve it that much. And also when they fell hopelessly behind on things, they weren't above just like stealing the technology from other countries, which mm. is fine. I mean, copyright law is, a, is fake anyways, but um, everyone worked together. Yeah. But uh, the thing though, is that like, this is not the first of like morally ambiguous and m ambiguous and weird shit that uh, the U S did in the name of defeating the Soviet union, like, you know, espionage or uh, the many, many mm. military interventions, oftentimes because of the dynamics of the cold, war they found themselves opposing indigenous people fighting off european colonization because mm -hmm. the soviet the soviets uh came off as very appealing to many people who were anti-colonial and a lot of european powers were american allies so you had a lot of situations in which the people who were fighting colonization were allies with the soviets and the people who were trying to reinforce white supremacy or or european hegemony were uh allied in america you saw that in rhodesia you saw that in south africa you saw you and you saw that in Vietnam and uh, yeah. that kind of continued that kind of continued and other sort of examples and this is the part where I'm like kind of thinking like this is when you talked about like of the lesser of two evils you went with the Nazis huh is that there's other uh -huh. cases in many times where the US has been involved during the Cold War with propping up far right fascists in various places as part of their anti-communist strategy because if you're fighting radical left-wing rebels and you need to find local opposition to that who do you think are going to be the sort of like you know militarized fighters against them mm. this this meant backing groups like right-wing death squads in central and south america that committed horrible atrocities and mass murders of indigenous peoples or uh you know operation condor where they actively overthrew like even like social democratic governments to impose right-wing dictators like augusto pinochet mm. who who you know like the pinochet regime is like responsible for killing uh, tens of thousands of people who are called the disappeared and also in in very literal cases like in operation gladio Gladi operation gladio was the cia's attempt to thwart communist influence in italy because italy had the most powerful communist party outside of the soviet bloc in europe after world war ii so like the italian mm -hmm. communist party was actually like very powerful and had a lot of influence in the country and like held a lot of seats in parliament so there was like this period which i think is called the years of lead in italy where both the soviets and the americans were giving money to like people to like you know do like assassinations and terrorists terrorism and hijackings and stuff like that in order to basically fight like a sort of political war between the right and left in italy to seal its fate and a lot of times under operation gladio which was the cia's sort of program for doing that uh they gave a lot of money to people who were formerly part of mussolini's regime because that's where mm. you could find people who had military training and were also against communism in italy oh goodness I don't know about America, man. I don't know about the United States. I think maybe I was going to say we had a good run, but I don't even know if we could call it that. I think it's just, <laughs> I think it's just uh, like, I'm, I'm of the point that this is not because it'd be, it's very, it'd be very easy if I was, you know, an expert on Sovietology and not American studies. This is why I'm, you know, doing one and not the other to paint the exact same picture of like the actions of the Soviet Union. They also did. Sure held a imperial system they uh they denied like they they said they weren't an empire but there are many countries that they held uh you know russian ethnic dominion mm. over for a very long time they had a brutal system of you know uh getting rid of dissidents and etc 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 i think that it's just more that we need to walk away from this concept that the cold war was like you know a, a clear good guy bad guy situation and that it was really yeah. just two countries it wasn't rocky it wasn't rocky for yeah that's that's what i and i mean this genuine that is how it is basically taught in schools in america is the cold war is rocky four and you have a clear good guy and you have a clear bad guy and you want and the good guy gotta win mm -hmm. and that and how does the good guy win boxing <laughs> by boxing by going back to yeah, the Russian, he's got all this fancy technology and training, but like Rocky's going to go to a mountain and chop some wood. And that's American hard work. That's 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 the work ethic. That's hustle grind set. That is like, you don't need any fancy. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yes, Rocky is a millionaire at this point in the franchise, but he doesn't need that money because he's just going to go to a mountain and chop wood and he's going to win because he's the best. And that's America. Yeah, I, I if, if there was like one thing that I would love to teach about the Cold War is that there's a is we really need to see it as 
two empires. And in my mind, like the way that country, like I, I'm of the of mind that no country is really like countries by their very nature of being countries are sort of amoral institutions that are interested in self-perpetuation and just growing their own power. And both of them mm. were the two countries that were beneficiaries of the collapse of the European colonial system after World War II. And they're they're basically fight, uh, playing hungry, hungry hippos, but with influence instead of pebbles. Yeah. And that was sort of the nature of it. And none of it was about like communism versus capitalism or really although i love the american framing uh communism versus democracy which is very yeah. ironic for how many democratic regimes that the u.s overthrew in order to put in right-wing dictators but either way just like how yeah a lot of the like the soviets would have said it was about like you know, liberation while a lot of times liberation meant answering to moscow <laughs> but um mm -hmm. both of them were hiding behind sort of these universal liberatory ideologies that they you know <laughs> did not did not live up to yeah and uh and but very often because like i grew up in Amer i grew up in canada canada is part of the american imperial core so my story of the cold war is very similar and uh i think that too many people are are, are, are dynamic of that is done and this is one of those cases uh with Werner von braun to kind of take it back to, to, to take it back home is that yeah it's another case of like the u.s making a sort of amoral decision in the name of growing an empire in competition with another empire. So Werner von Braun, not, maybe not a good guy, maybe not a great guy. Definitely. Yeah? There's, uh, I, I mean, at the most, at the m complicated, uh, yeah, uh, complicated at the most generous, but in my mind, there's like, there's far too much of a motivation to rehabilitate him because of his, uh, being so key to so many important parts of his American history, rocket brain. But, uh, so there's like a lot of motivation to try and, find the best possible way to frame the story in him in there but it to me the picture being painted and it seems like this is changing over time as like more and more time passes and more research gets done that it, it's 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 making him look worse not better mm. well if you want to make your feed look better and not worse Ooh. you can follow us at probs not aliens on twitter and blue sky we don't need codes anymore yeah just join us over there on blue sky that is a place with freedom is blue sky that is a place with free you're free to do and say whatever you want on blue sky and twitter because elon says free speech is back on twitter until except for all the things that he banned unless you say sis whatnot can't say that it's a slur according to elon and it's we can't it's a whole thing we really have been ragging on elon for the last couple of episodes and i do not apologize for it tristan what do you do on the internet other than this podcast uh, i make a do you do anything i think you do I, occasionally video, you do more than me it feels like oh well, that's about to that's about to change i think i make a youtube channel called step back where i talk about why it's important to understand history if you want to understand the world that we're in today and i feel like this episode did a pretty decent job of that right now i do appreciate you covering the all the palestine stuff stuff just because I feel like there will never be enough people talking about it. And I appreciate you making videos about it. Yeah. Now, Scott, if I wanted to learn why Deadpool uses yellow word balloons, where would I go for that? <laughs> hey, that's a great one because I worked on that or I, that it's got a cameo with Mike Rugnetta from idea channel. And I, he's great. One of my internet heroes. Uh, that's my YouTube channel, nerd sync, N E R D S Y N C. If you want to learn about comics and superheroes, the hard Harlem Globetrotters. I'm making a video about them. You want to learn why the Harlem Globetrotters keep popping up in Scooby-Doo or like why it's the most notable Scooby-Doo cameo you can think of? And if it's not the one that you can think of, ask your dad. Your dad will say, oh yeah, the Harlem Globetrotters. I wrote that as a joke in my video and it turned out to be true. I turned my phone on uh, to record a video of Emily's dad and I was just like, hey, who do you f first think of when you say, when I say Scooby-Doo guest stars? And the very first thing you said was Harlem Globetrotters. And I was like, Thank God you said that because I already wrote that as a joke into my video. <laughs> so it worked out. Yeah, that's my YouTube channel, N-E-R-D-S-Y-N-C. I'm trying to do more video essays this year uh, just because I have fun making them. So learn about how the Harlem Globetrotters, both in real life and in cartoons, are uh, unfortunately akin to uh, a minstrel show. That'll be fun. Oh, boy. You can also follow our podcast if you want episodes early over at nebulae.tv slash probably not aliens mm -hmm. that it supports the show and yeah you get episodes early it's great uh, ad free as well we don't talk about that very much you can also support the show for free by writing reviews on apple podcasts and leaving feedback on spotify thank you to everyone who does that and especially if you want to support the show 
for free and without even needing a computer in front of you. You can also just tell your friends. If you are out in public, just shout out the name of the podcast to anyone who's passing by. If you're in your office listening to this, write it in the company Slack with no context. Mm -hmm. It's great. So thank you to everyone who does that. And a very simple website you can send people is probsnetaliens.com. Yeah. It's got links to everything, uh, everywhere you can listen to the show. So until next time, my name is Scott Nicewander. I'm Tristan Johnson. And the truth is out there, probably... another rocket sound there we go the brahm i think mike Rugnetta called it the brahm yeah that's what they're called brahms Werner von brahms <laughs>